With threats to our nation waiting around every corner, adaptability is more important than ever. When conditions change without notice, quick strategic thinking is crucial. And with obstacles consistently impending, determination is essential in overcoming them. It's this willingness, decisiveness, and resilience that sets Marines apart. With our fighting spirit, we don't just fight battles, we win them. Marines are the constant our nation counts on to fight the unknown. And through adaptable problem solving, we do just that. Learn more at Marines.com. Getting engaged is a moment worth cherishing. A one-of-a-kind ring that you design at Blue Nile can help your love sparkle. Just choose your diamond and setting. When you've found the one, you'll get it delivered right to your door. Finding the right engagement ring can be nerve-wracking. At Blue Nile, you'll have the expert guidance needed and a diamond guarantee that ensures you're getting the highest quality at the best price. Cherish all of life's moments and save up to 30% at BlueNile.com. That's BlueNile.com. It is Ryan here, and I have a question for you. What do you do when you win? Like, are you a fist pumper? A woo a hand clapper, a high-fiver. I kind of like the high-five, but if you want to hone in on those winning moves, check out Chumba Casino. At ChumbaCasino.com, choose from hundreds of social casino-style games for your chance to redeem serious cash prizes. There are new game releases weekly, plus free daily bonuses, so don't wait. Start having the most fun ever at ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. VGW. Void or prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus. A pivotal night in the calendar, an annual excuse for fierce debate or outrage, a barometer for either Britain's sporting progress or decline. That's how Steve Ryder introduced the 50th anniversary edition of the BBC Sports Personality of the Yearbook. Now, 16 years on from that, Spotty has grown even more into an arena event, but it's just as controversial and no more so when six names were revealed this week in the shortest of shortlists imaginable. No British swimmers, no British para-athletes, a year ahead of the greatest show on earth, Tokyo 2020. We'll go through it and try and make sense of it. I'm John. And I'm Michael. Coming up, we'll look at what I can only describe as another interesting week for British athletics, as the woman set to take over as UKA's chief executive won't now take up the role after all following claims that she allowed her husband to continue to work as a coach despite being banned from teaching due to an inappropriate relationship with a 15-year-old girl. Plus, we'll have news on two world championship events, trampolining and sailing, and all the very latest ahead of, as John said, the greatest show on earth, Tokyo 2020. And don't forget, get in touch with us anytime at Anything But F on Twitter or message us on Insta and Facebook. It's Anything But Footy on there. And subscribe to the podcast. And thanks to those who've reviewed and rated us on Apple Podcasts, including this one. John and Michael's knowledge is second to none. And by the end of the podcast, you'll be an enthusiast of more sports than you thought possible. (laughs) Thank you very much. That is our aim. So the short list is out and it's quite a short list. Six names. I think we kind of all predicted that they would be on there somewhere, but there seems to be some glaring omissions. Should we run through the, the the six to start with? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a couple that we spoke about on episode 34 of Anything But Footy, where we were talking about the fact it was award season. And we were talking about Dina Asher-Smith, who picked up the, the Sports Woman of the Year Award at the Sunday Times. And you and I had a what turned out to be a fairly heated debate about that <laughs> award, because I had suggested that I thought Katarina Johnson-Thompson's achievements um, at the World Championship eclipsed those of Dina Asher-Smith's, and and you disagreed, and you're still wrong on that. (laughs) So those two are on the list for Sports Personality of the Year. Lewis Hamilton, of course, who's won another world title in F1, is there. Alan Wynne-Jones, captain, of course, of the Welsh rugby team, Grand Slam winning rugby team, did well at the World Cup. Uh, Raheem Sterling, who I think his achievements this year, I have to say, has has broadened his appeal just beyond football. I think he's just achieved not, not with Joe Gomez, to be fair. No, that's a, a, an interesting thing. It's always been an interesting what constitutes an actual personality. Uh, but I do think Raheem Sterling has done some tremendous work, you know, both in football, obviously, and being part of a team that, that did so well domestically, being part of the England team, and beyond that as well, standing up you know, against racists, which I think has been a a very important narrative this year, Um, probably more important than any sporting achievement, in all honesty. Um, And Ben Stokes, obviously, you know, who's 
had issues as well in, in the past, but as far as cricket is concerned and winning the Cricket World Cup this year with England, um, an all-rounder who's, who's done really well. So those are, are the six. I mean, I don't understand why Alan Wynne Jones is, is in the six. In, the, in you know, no, I think he's a, 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 an inspiring rugby player, and obviously Wales did you know very well to win the Grand Slam and and the World Cup semi-finals. But he hasn't really done anything different, or I don't see why he's propelled it's, into the top six. It's always very difficult, isn't it, in a team sport to put yourself head and shoulders above everyone else, and that's why. Traditionally, Sports Personality of the Year, there weren't many footballers that won it. There has been in recent times. So, you know, when you go back to the 90s, you had to be Paul Gascoigne to win it. You had to be Michael Owen. You, 2001, it was, it was David Beckham. For rugby players, where there's, there's 15 in the, in the start, you've got the squad of 30, 40. It's been even harder. So, obviously, Johnny Wilkinson in, in 2003... Yeah, and also the Welsh won it last year, so he can't win it with Geraint Thomas, so he can't win it this year. <laughs> well, and, Ryan, and Ryan Giggs was the only other footballer to have won, and I think that's the issue with with Raheem slightly is that it's a bit tribal football. Yes, you know Harry Kane was third last year, and arguably you know maybe should have been higher because of the, the success that England had had in the World Cup. But again, they didn't win anything. So golden why? boot winner, but when Gary Lineker yeah. won the golden boot in '86, he, he, he wasn't even nominated. He wasn't even nominated. So has been in the top three. But back in 86, Kenny Dalglish was the footballer there because of his achievements at the time with Liverpool. So it is very difficult. You would hope, obviously, Raheem Sterling's achievements with England would, would, would stand out. But it, it's not been a, a World Cup year, has it? It's not been a no. European Championship year. And I think for a footballer, they need to probably perform at that stage. And I, th- I think that brings us nicely onto the athletes. And we talked about Dina and Katerina, as you say, in, in, the, in the last episode. So I'm not going to repeat what we said there. That Katerina should have won. No, that Dina was obviously the rightful winner. Um, it's not Olympic year. So I always think that that means that kind of rules out athletes. But actually, I've been looking back at uh, the, the, the past winners. And to be fair... The last athlete to have won was Dame Kelly Holmes. 2004. 2004 at the Athens, and that was Olympic year. Before that, it was Jonathan Edwards in 1995, Linford Christie in 1993, and Liz McColgan in 1991. And they were all world championship performances. And what have we seen this year, why Dina and Katarina are nominated, is because they are gold medalists in world championships. So actually, they stand a really good chance, I think, of being in the top three. But for me, the only winner in this six is is Ben Stokes. Yeah, it's interesting because I always, I'm not a gambling man and certainly um, wouldn't recommend um, betting. But I have one bet. I have two bets every year. I have a grand national bet, like most people. And, and will I, it snow at Christmas? Uh, no, and I always have. Uh, well, I always used to have a sports personality of the year bet. And I would always put this bet on in January. Therefore, try not just to predict a shortlist, but predicting what would happen in the sporting year. Now, for many years, um, I used to just basically flip-flop between my two favourite tall sportsmen, Greg Rutherford and Justin Rose, and, um, and they were always about 150, 200 to 1, and I would put my five pounds on. And they've, they've been on the shortlist, obviously, neither of them have ever, ever won the award. Now, last year, I put my bet on Dina Asher-Smith, and she was nominated, but she didn't finish in the top three. And this year, I didn't do it. And if I had done it... <laughs> I would have gone for Katarina Johnson Thompson because I, I did really believe that she was going to, you know, step up and, and win the world championship this year. So, I but, think but but Ben Stokes that that batting performance in the World Cup final and then obviously the Ashes as well, where he saved the Ashes and, and England tied it. I mean, it's a massive BBC event. The Test match special is a is a huge radio event for the BBC and also on on podcasts with their cricket and stuff. I can't see anyone else winning than Ben Stokes and arguably England had never won the World Cup before and you know and they should have done and he was played a massive part in that even though we've said as a team game you know he had to stand up and I think he did it became like the both of ashes it became Freddie Flintoff yeah and both previous winners of the award if I was to go for a top three um, I would probably go Raheem Sterling third uh, Dean Rasher Smith second and Ben Stokes first that's how I think the public will vote it's not necessarily how I would vote and it brings us to there's only six. Yep. And I, and I said it's a, it's a short list. Now, why is there only six? Well, again, because I thought there used to be 10 or, or 12. There was 10 for a long time, and then it became, I think, 12 probably after London 2012, because after the home there Olympics, was so how, how would you narrow um, a short list down, down to 10? So I think it became 12 for a while. 
Um, and then obviously with, with 12, you used to get this this kind of tribal vote that, that you say. So, for example, the rugby league fraternity would get behind someone like Kevin Sinfield and get him there. Um, the Welsh would maybe get behind their man, uh, Ryan Giggs, was more a lifetime achievement award, I think, the year that he won it. The halfpenny, another rugby player that, that's been in the top three. So I think then they tried to stop those campaigns. So when I was growing up, they always tried to get like a pigeon fancier, didn't they? Or yes. like Bob Nudd was always the one, the angler. They always tried to get him there saying saying he, he's the sportsman of the year. And, you know, the same happened with Phil the Power Taylor, of course. So I think what they tried to do is announce the shortlist and make it short on the night so they couldn't have these concerted campaigns. But when they did that last year, they kept the six until the night, and then you just voted. Because in 2017, the whole issue was that Jonathan Ray, who, you know, is a world champion in his own right and deserves to be recognised, but he finished second in 2017 behind Mo Farah. Northern Ireland vote. Um, And, you know, you just think, why have they changed it again from six on the night to now six two weeks before? Because... There were some glaring omissions from this six. Adam Peaty, Alice Tay, Hannah Cockcroft are three that... Jonathan and Ray Jonathan again. Ray kind of leap to my, it, to my mind and front of mind. And, and Peaty and, and Alice Tay, and we've talked about these guys on our podcast week in, week out. These are doing stuff. These swimmers are doing stuff that nobody else in the world is doing. Yeah, and I, I've read quite a bit since the shortlist was announced that there should be separate awards for a, a man, there should be separate awards for a woman, there should be a separate award for a, a para-athlete, and that does happen at other award ceremonies. But I think Sports Personality of the Year, it must be approaching, what, 70 years old now. Um, it's always one main award on the night, and I think that should re- be retained. I think there should just be one main award on the night. There's an issue around the name personality what constitutes a personality steve davis won the award <laughs> back in his pot michael owen won the award you can steve hardly, redgrave <laughs> you can hardly call them personalities could you but but that is the award and you know i think um adam Peaty would be my my sports man of of the year um probably for me actually probably the sports person of the year for what, what he's achieved very close to Alice Tay, a seven-time world champion. You know, yeah, two times world record holder at Lo- in London, and she beat PT to the British Swimming Award. Overall, the British Swimmer of the Year. Yeah, I mean, her outstanding achievements have, have been phenomenal this year. And, and then, obviously, we, we had the, the IPC Swimming in London, and then, obviously, um, we also then had the IPC Athletics, which we spoke about a few weeks ago. Hannah Cockroft bang on form, back involved again. She's a, a previous nominee. She has a personality, I can tell you that as mm. well. So, you know, if we're looking for an actual personality, she's got one. I think her achievements, again, in, in terms of, you know, the, the medals that she won out of the IPC um, World Athletics. And she really did win them because last yeah. year she lost to Carrie Adonegan. Great story. And this, and this year she came back and, uh, and beat her. And there is that rivalry. And I, I, I just wish sometimes... I know the BBC is a, is a much kind of bashed organisation, and I'm not here to do that, but I wish they would just sometimes gauge the opinion and, and just think about how is this going to come across when we put out these six names. Do you know what? I think Sports Personality of the Year, my final kind of thought on it, I think is the closest we have in the United Kingdom to the Oscars. You know, I, I think it is... The, the Oscars is massively talked about, massively hyped news of it goes around the world and you know every year the nominees come out you know not enough black actors or actresses being nominated the academy gets it wrong time after time and it's speculated and when they get it wrong by reading out the wrong result (laughs) and when they get it wrong by reading out the wrong result as well you know that i think this is this is the closest you do not get this kind of talkability around the bafta awards or the brit awards even in this country this is the one award ceremony that most people seem to have an opinion on, and that probably suits the BBC a couple of weeks before Christmas. It's been on telly for our entire lives, and we'll sit and watch it again. Of that, there is no doubt. Still to come on anything but footy, sailing, hockey, trampolining, and cross-country, but Zara Hyde-Peters, the chief exec of UK athletics that never was. Due to start on December the 1st, She's agreed to step back from her position following the revelations that her husband had coached females, potentially as young as 16, at her athletics club that she helped run, despite being banned from teaching for an inappropriate relationship with a 15-year-old girl 
as a PE teacher. Now, UK Athletics Chair, that's the official company name of British Athletics, by the way, Chris Clark, issued a statement at the start of the week saying the UKA board convened a meeting and discussed the situation fully. Following that meeting, I had time with Zara to review the situation and we've agreed together that she will now not be taking up her position as CEO on the 1st of December. Now, on last week's pod, we revealed he'd been backing her appointment despite promising a review, but pressure, obviously, particularly from UK Sport and Birmingham 2022 Commonwealth Games, where Hyde Peters was a board member, seemed to have made him and the whole of British athletics see sense. Safeguarding, as we've said for the last few weeks, isn't an issue you mess around with. But the big question, Michael, what on earth is next? Well, three words um, from Zara Hyde Peters' statement that rather stuck in my throat here. And those words were the trial by media. And I don't think we can blame the media for the mess that Zara Hyde Peters and British Athletics have got themselves into here. It's not the media um, that has, has got themselves into this situation. They've simply reported the facts. And clearly, due diligence hasn't been done here. And this is the week, of course, where we've lost two chief executives in sport before they've even taken up the role. Zara Hyde peters at UK Athletics and David Pemsel of the Premier League. He won't be taking up his role either. Now, it's been, as I said right at the start, an interesting week for British Athletics. And I've got a great deal of sympathy for them, if you like, as an organisation. Because, you know, how much due diligence can you do? On the surface, Zara Hyde peters as we said in our last episode of Anything But Footy, on the surface, she had the perfect CV. She was a, a former international athlete. She had experience running an NGB, a national governing body of British sport, and that was triathlon. She held senior leadership roles in the NHS. So she seemed on the surface to be the perfect appointment. But we are now in an era, of course, with things like social media, and text messages and all the rest of it, which is, you know, what's affected the Premier League uh, potential CEO, David Pemsel. It was historic text messages uh, that have come to light where, you know, everything is out there. Everything is on the table. So you need to be squeaky clean. You need to have a completely blank piece of paper as far as these organisations are concerned. Now, UKA are in receipt of £27 million of our money, National Lottery money. They get that money from UK Sports, so they get that money from members of the public. And therefore, if you're in receipt of £27 million of public money, your governance, your safeguarding needs to be absolutely bang on. And I think if we've learnt one thing over the last year maybe, couple of years maybe, in British sport, it's that, you know, we've been able to set systems up that are excellent at winning medals, But the cost of winning those medals with the individuals, the athletes, the support staff and others has been very, very bad. And, you know, it's that safeguarding, that governance and that cost to to all those people involved in British sport, which needs to be looked at. And that's why this has become such a huge issue. But I wouldn't say it was a trial by media. I think that's fair. I mean, Chris Clark, the chairman, hasn't exactly um, shone during this uh, kind of uh, couple of weeks, as you say. They also lost their performance director over the Alberto Salazar affair recently. And of course, they had been waiting for the new CEO to start and and sort it all out. And and, and and the chair came in quite recently, Chris yep. Clark as well. All this, of course, months to go before Tokyo. So they are now looking for a new CEO, a new great British boss, which brings us nicely on to Jack Buckner, the <laughs> former World European and Commonwealth medalist in the 80s and currently chief exec of British Swimming. He, according to the Times, who've been leading this story uh, from start to finish, is the front runner. Uh, no pun intended, to take charge of British athletics. And we spoke to Buckner in our Anything But Footy spin-off, Great British Bosses, and he told us he has experience of taking on organisations that need some real focus. I came in with some fairly tough stuff to get through um, in terms of um, para So there'd been this independent inquiry, and I had to get to grips with that fairly quickly. So I'd say probably the thing that I was most concerned about when I came in was that there was um, a bit of a some legacy issues really from 2016 and so I did quite a bit of work just to kind of move that on and get a positive uh, approach around para swimming so I'd say that was probably the first thing I walked into and often with these jobs you never quite know what you're going to walk into and that was the thing I, I walked into 
Probably there are other bigger things I've done which are maybe a bit less public, such as look at our event strategy and things like that. But that was, that was the one I, I tackled head on. And you can hear more of what he did with that Paralympic swimming investigation, the change in focus on coaching and his desire to improve well-being for his swimmers on our Great British Bosses podcast. It is well worth it. I suppose the thing to say, Michael, is at least he's not a Nike man because he's definitely an Adidas man. And the is it an issue that he is so well known in athletics or could that be a benefit? Well, I think traditionally sports have looked um, within themselves and I actually think that's been one of the big problems certainly in my opinion I've stated this several times uh, and not just on this podcast as well I think one of the problems with athletics sometimes is the people involved the athletes I include them in this and the administrators and you look at the IAAF you've got Seb Co, you've got John Ridgen both ex-athletes sometimes I do get the feeling they're a little bit too close to what they're trying to administrate now Jack Buckner again fantastic CV you know he oversaw a terrific performance when he was in charge at British Triathlon he went into what was a pretty toxic situation at British Swimming and I think he's moved that organization on and again we go back to those words safeguarding and governance and that was one of his big challenges there he went into an organization that were being rocked by very important bullying allegations that needed to be tackled Uh, and I think he did a very good job tackling them and as you will know having listened, of course, to the Great British Bosses podcast and, you know, been part of that interview with me, he is still a massive, massive athletics fan as well. So, again, on the surface, if he is the front runner, the CV, the application form, looks absolutely perfect, doesn't it? You know, he's gone triathlon, he's gone to swimming, where he's had experience of of taking an organisation on that needed some change and needed changes around governance and safeguarding, which clearly is what needs to happen at British Athletics. He also then has the athletics box ticked, if you like, as well. But I just wonder, I just think maybe now is the time for some of our, our British sports to maybe start looking outside of sport. You know, these are well remunerated positions. They were talking about three hundred thousand pounds a year salary. So, you know, you could attract someone from a decent business. Now, whether that person has the know how, the knowledge of track and field of athletics, I'm not sure that's so important when you're coming in as a chief executive. I think you can learn that, but the skills perhaps that are harder to learn are the skills to be a leader, the skills to be a front man or front woman in an organization. And those transferable skills, for me, I think, are probably more important for British athletics at the moment than someone that ran round a track or threw a shot put or a javelin or jumped a long way. I think the leadership skills, first and foremost, need to be looked at. The athletics background, well, I think that can be pretty secondary. Um, And that's not to talk down Jack Butner, because I said there is is so much going for him in his favour, if indeed he wants this role or he's offered this role. But I don't think it should be a simple like-for-like replacement. I do think, and I think they will, British athletics need to open this up wider. Yeah, I think you're right. I think what I've learned doing the Great British Bosses podcast is that, you know, leadership is leadership, whether it's in sport, whether it's in the health service, whether it's in human resources, et cetera, et cetera. And I think the thing that, you know, really stands out for me is that you want a CEO who can come in with a vision knows what they want to do, knows how they're going to do it and inspires people to work with them and have a team around them who can challenge them when need to be challenged, but also uh, help them to, uh, to to get what they want across. And I think, you know, it is a massive, massive moment for British athletics. We're not that far away from Tokyo. They've worked out what they're going to do performance director wise with a team of people. They now need someone to come in with some kind of vision who can just get them through Tokyo and then kick on from there. And um, and aside mm. from, from Tokyo, which obviously, you know, from a lot of people's point of view is, is the big thing looming on the horizon. You know, we had the statement from British Athletics this week about Alberto Salazar. And they've announced yeah. that independent review over its handling of issues concerning the Nike Origin project. And they are essentially saying they want to check the robustness of their future governance. So, you know, that is a, a massive thing in the intray of whoever comes in and starts this job. And Zara High Peters was meant to be starting this job um, on the, the 2nd of December. 
And obviously, I think the first thing on her agenda was probably going to be involving that that uh, independent review of what happened between British Athletics, Alberto Salazar, the Nike Oregon project. So they are now, however many months down the line, further down the line, appointing the new person. And again, they've got this independent review that's going to arrive on their desk, spring 2020, the results. And they've agreed to implement the findings as well. So, you know, there's a there's a massive, massive challenge there, isn't there? And it's an in, yeah. it's an important challenge. And it's not a subject, it's not an area that, that I can find anything to be flippant or hu- humorous about. You know, I think, you know, it's it's a huge crossroads for what is the, the biggest Olympic sport traditionally. Absolutely. And we've talked about Alberto Salazar so many times and people will know that he was the coach of the British athlete Mo Farah between 2011 and 2017. And it, and I'm glad that British athletics have actually come out and said we are going to announce this review. As you say, the independent review will be undertaken by John Merzad, who is a lawyer who worked on the culture and climate investigations at British Cycling and governance issues, uh, governance issues at British Equestrian as well. So we've got a big background in, in reviewing British sport. And I'm glad they've actually come out and said this review is getting underway because they were waiting for Hyde Peters to come in and start it. But, of course, what has come to light as well in the last few weeks is that, you know, she's best mates with Mo Farah um, mm. and, and, and friends with Mo Farah. And, and, and if it hadn't been something else, it, you know, question marks would have been raised and all that. So I think British athletics have done the right thing by saying, right, this is the review. And whoever comes in is now, as you rightly say, it's going to be the top of their inbox uh, when they start uh, in the new year once they appoint that. Talking of Mo Farah, I can't believe... We said it in March. He's going to be back on the track. <laughs> yeah. And Mo Farah announces this week, I'm giving up the marathon. I'm coming back on the track. I'm going to drive for a fifth gold medal at the Olympics in Tokyo in the 10,000 metres. And get this, Michael, at the age of 37, as he will be then, he will be the oldest ever competitor, let alone a gold medalist or medalist, if he competes in Tokyo. Why is he coming back? Well, first and foremost, of course, he has to qualify. So, you know, it's not guaranteed that he'll be there, but I would um, bet a substantial part of my mortgage that that he probably will (laughs) qualify. Why is he coming back? Because he knows he's not going to win a medal at the marathon. Um, He's given it a go. Um, do you think with the with the Kipchoge thing that he's moved on think, so much? Yeah, I just think um, he's realised probably over the last year or so, and I know there were other issues going on in Chicago um, this year, but he finished, what, eighth, I think, in yeah, Chicago this year. You know, he, he has won a Chicago marathon. He's finished third in, in the London marathon. But he's someone that is used to winning. He's someone that's, that's used to winning medals. He wouldn't want to go take part in that marathon in wherever it's going to be, and it won't be Tokyo, be in Sapporo, uh, to make up the numbers. And I think he's probably just made the decision uh, with his team and looked at probably who his opposition will be in the 10,000 metres, who's come to the fore in the 10,000 metres since he stepped away from it and thought he's got a better chance of, of winning a medal there. He, he admitted it in his YouTube announcement that he might not have the speed because obviously with marathon, you do more endurance training, don't you? And, and one of his yep. big things was that kick in the last, what, two, you know, two or three laps of either the five or, or, or 10K. So that'll be a, a big question mark. And we'll see him, no doubt we'll see him running at British Athletics events uh, in, the, in, in the, you know, the course of the summer and spring and hopefully at the, uh, the Highgate 10K, the night of the 10K PBs as well. It'd be amazing to see him running at the British Championship there. But he, he's one of these people, Michael, isn't it? He he just can't give it up, can he? I mean, no. I, I, I've read his autobiography, and it, it, it always came across in that, that you know he's got this personality that he just loves to win and just wants to be involved. And he said earlier this year, I, I miss the track and I miss representing my country. And he just cannot give it up. And despite all the question marks, as you said about Chicago, you know, that whole press conference before that was about Alberto Salazar and about Mo Farah. And, you know, we've said it so many times on this podcast, there is nothing to suggest that there is, you know, that he, that he has always denied uh, doing anything wrong. And, you know, he's got the uh, the, the clean the drugs tests, if you like, to, to prove it. That's his argument. But all that is great copy for journalists. It's brilliant for people like you and me that we get to talk about it more. But actually, if he didn't want to, why would he be carrying on? Because he could just walk away from it and no one would question his legacy of four Olympic gold medals. Yeah, you're absolutely right. He could walk away. Probably a very wealthy man. He could um, sit on the TV couches. I'm sure he'd be 
in demand. He could go on the reality TV shows if indeed he wanted to, you know, stay in the limelight. Or he could go back home and spend time with his wife and kids, who he's, you know, famously always put very front and centre around some of his biggest sporting moments and some of his biggest achievements. Um, he could just, just walk away, but... I think, um, as lots of footballers often say, you're a long time retired. Um, you know, 36 as he is now is is old in terms of his sport, but it's really no age, is it? You know, he's got another 50-odd years probably on the planet. So, you know, if, if the legs are still working, if he's still enjoying it, and who wouldn't enjoy going and competing and maybe taking part in an Olympic final, even if it doesn't lead to the glories that he's used to, then, you know, I understand why why he probably does want to carry on and, and want to continue. But as you say there, he will be hugely, hugely in the spotlight. He will be a man that people are hanging off their, his every word. There will be microphones, cameras, notebooks and pens following every move he makes between now and the Olympics. Well, one nation Mo won't be competing against is Russia, and we'll come on to that in a moment because British gymnastics have booked a spot for Team GB in the trampolining at the Olympics in Tokyo next summer. A top eight place in the final of the World Championships in Tokyo would guarantee that spot, and it was left to 30-year-old Laura Gallagher from Bridgewater to spring a surprise, see what I did there, finishing third in the semi-finals, sealing her spot in the final and a place for Britain at Tokyo 2020. She finished sixth overall in that final, but overall a great week for her Rio silver medalist Bryony Page finished in 15th uh, former world number one and reigning British champion Kat Driscoll didn't quite reach the semis and British gymnastics enjoyed medal success in other non-Olympic events in Tokyo with the women winning team silver behind the hosts Japan and British tumbling gymnasts produced a masterclass to take both the men's and women's team world titles while Elliot Brown won silver again in the tumbling individual and Shanice Davidson retained her world silver medal and Megan Keeley won the bronze medal in the women's. And of course, the thing about a career in trampolining is there's lots and up, lots of ups and downs. <laughs> I thank you. If this is anything but footy. Don't forget you can get in touch with us on our website, anythingbutfooty.com. You can email us. Uh, that's anythingbutfooty at gmail.com. You can find us on Twitter at anythingbutf. We're on Facebook, on Instagram, and on YouTube as well. Well, Championship Sailing starts on Tuesday, the 3rd of December, and British sailors Ben Saxon and Nicky Boniface of well, they've got themselves ready, prepared for that in the perfect way by winning the Oceana Championship, the perfect boost ahead of the NACRA 17 uh, World Championships. They finished first in five of the eight races. Uh, they've shown some excellent form in 2019. Uh, winners of the European Championships, they won a World Cup Series silver in Enoshima and they won bronze at the Tokyo Test Event as well. It's been recommended that Russia are banned from all major sporting events for four years from 2020, following the latest revelations about doping in the country. The International Olympic Committee has now backed the strongest sanctions for manipulation of the Moscow laboratory data in January 2019, when Russia were trying to persuade the World Anti-Doping Agency, WADA, that they should be welcomed back into athletics and world sport. WADA said information had been tampered with and deleted, and they'll vote on that ban in the coming weeks. And should a four-year sanction come into force, it would cover both the 2020 and 2022 Olympic and Paralympic Games in Tokyo and Beijing. The Russian flag would be prohibited from major events during the four-year period, but athletes who can prove they are clean and not impacted will be allowed to compete as neutral athletes. And that will be a discussion point I'm absolutely certain on a future episode of Anything But Footy. Here's the most interesting story, I think, from the world of Olympic and Paralympic sport this week. Uh, for the Olympic Games in 2024, the surfing could be held in... Paris? Tahiti. What? <laughs> Tahiti, 9,755 miles from Paris, a 23 hours flying time. Tahiti, which is a French Polynesian island, is up against Biarritz, which I went to on holiday a few years ago and I rather thought would be a perfect location for <laughs> Olympic sailing. In fact, I was going to put myself forward for, for covering the entire event if it was in Biarritz. It's a lovely place. Brittany is a, another option, of course, so we could stay at one of those campsites in northern France and cover the sailing there. The IOC could make a decision 
on the 12th of December. There's going to be other decisions made on the 12th of December. I just can't bring them to mind at the moment. Uh, but yes, it rather puts the row over Sapporo and Tokyo and where the marathon and the race walks into a little bit of perspective. And it makes Weymouth, where the sailing in 2012 was held, um, just a little bit of a hop, skip and a jump because, uh, yeah, Tahiti, nearly 10,000 miles away, could be hosting Olympic surfing. Incredible story. Now, despite suffering horrific injury during the Olympic qualifiers against Malaysia in November, British hockey player Sam Ward said this week he still wants to go to the Games in Tokyo and has definitely not retired, despite reports suggesting he had. The 28-year-old suffered significant facial fractures after being hit by the ball, underwent surgery on November the 13th to reconstruct his cheek, and last week saw a number of eye specialists and currently has a very small amount of sight in his left eye. Now, it will take several months to see if there's any improvement in his sight. In the meantime, Sam says he's not giving up easily. We wish him and his family well. Well, end where we started with athletics. And I've always thought, actually, cross-country running would be a perfect sport for the Winter Olympic Games. But that's not going to happen any time soon. Although Great Britain and Northern Ireland are sending a 40-strong team to the European Cross-Country Championships, which are being held next month in Lisbon. Andrew Butchart is the biggest name in the men's team, a bronze medalist in 2017. 21 previous medalists, including 13 from the 2018 events in the Netherlands. Uh, The women's team includes Jess Judd, Charlotte Arter, and nine times medalist Kate Avery. There are events for the senior men and women, the under-23 men and women, the junior men and women, and a mixed relay event as well and the olympics always want to appeal to the youngsters they'll all love doing cross country from memory at school (laughs) so you know they should be looking at that for the winter olympics totally agree absolutely if we miss your sport do tell us at anything but f on twitter you can message us on insta and facebook we love getting your messages during the week and we are active on social media so do get in touch if you wish to at any time may not come back to you in the middle of the night but please do try and as we prepare for the annual look back at 2019 if you haven't yet told someone about anything but footy tell them this week to subscribe to the podcast it's a celebration of all things olympic and paralympic every week not every four years and they can join in the row and the debate at sports personality of the year too sports social podcast network judy was boring hello then judy discovered chumbacasino.com it's my little escape Now Judy's the life of the party. Oh, baby, mama's bringing home the bacon. Whoa, take it easy, Judy. The Chumba life is for everybody. So go to ChumbaCasino.com and play over 100 casino-style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. Voidware prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details.